Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Claudia Berlinski. I am the director of the McDonough Museum of Art, and we are here this morning to listen to Amy Tice Giza speak about her work and um, her process. And I just want to uh, give you a little information about her, her before we get started. Amy was born in Philadelphia and currently resides in Boston. She received a BAA from Amherst College majoring in fine arts and graduated from the New England School of Photography before completing her MFA in photography with honors at Parsons in New York City. She has been the director and lead faculty with the New Hampshire Institute of Art, which is a low residency MFA program. Um, she also previously was assistant professor of art at the Community College of Rhode Island. She has participated in numerous solo and group exhibitions, both nationally and internationally. She's attended multiple residencies, including Assets for Artists at Mass MoCA and Meat Factory International Center for Contemporary Art in Czechoslovakia. Her current work consists of large scale, unique silver gelatin skiograms, which are direct recordings of the shadow patterns in a room at night. The artist often pairs her imagery with sound com compositions that are created by translating the image to audio files. And uh, without further ado, I will um, let Amy take it from here and talk about that process more in depth. And um, we can take questions at the end, um, although there is a, a chat area if anyone wants to type something in the chat um, that I could maybe ask as a question if anyone's shy about bringing it up themselves later. Great, thank you so much, Claudia. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate that. Um, let me just pull up the slideshow for you. And is that visible for everybody? Yeah, fantastic. Um, so I'm gonna just jump right in. Um, so often when I think about photography, I think about the fact that it was born with a really unfixed identity. It's been shaped by so many different points of view and it's shifted its form almost every decade, just as our society has with each new technological development from 1826 until today. Um, as artists and innovators grapple with the identity and the definition of the medium of photography, there are different aspects that get examined and scrutinized. Um, so much of what drives my practice is questioning how we define photography as a medium right now and how our understanding of photographic images is shaped by the way that they function within a larger cultural context. And so I kind of start with a question. How do ideas take form as art? How do our perceptions shape both what we make and how we understand the artwork of others? One framing that has helped guide my work comes from philosophy. Um, I have a two second exercise for everybody to participate in. When I say the word chair, what specifically does it look like in your mind's eye? What's it made out of? What color is it? What material? So what you just pictured in your head is an example of an apperceptive type. Uh, it's a classification of form that helps you to simplify the sensory input that's coming into your brain. And there's a philosopher, George Santayana, and he wrote a book entitled The Sense of Beauty. And it lays out how he understands aesthetics and his definition of what makes things beautiful. And in talking about form of artwork, he states that part of a positive reaction that you may have to perceiving something is because it actually conforms to your expectations for that specific type of thing. There's a recognition and that awakening of memory is pleasant and so therefore enhances your experience of the thing itself. So basically, if something looks more familiar, we tend to like it more. So to bring this philosophical discussion a little bit closer to photography, many have articulated that what is unique about our medium is that the photograph has an indexical relationship to the thing that created it in the world. This belief depends on there being a connection between the real and what's represented. 
A photograph of a chair is and also is not a chair. It represents the chair, but it also fundamentally is linked to the chair itself. Light bounced off that exact chair sitting in the gallery space, entered the camera and created the image that's hanging on the wall next to it, hence the indexical link. Um, and it looks photographic because it looks like the chair itself. It conforms to our expectation of what a photograph should look like. So we read the world through signs and signifiers with all the complexity of parsing reality from representation now embedded in everything about our lives. Uh, when we see grumpy cat, for example, shared around online, we know that this is a meme of a cat, that this cat actually existed, and that the cat also stands in for anyone having a bad day. Some studies are now saying that we communicate more with images than with text. This puts more emphasis on our ability to read photographs and images, but it also means that our expectations may be shifting in how those same photographs function within our society. So to my mind, it makes sense that our understanding or our definition of photographs might change in this context. I'm in favor personally of expanding our expectations and having a broader definition of the medium. So now I wanna shift and actually start to talk about my work specifically now that we have a little bit of a foundation that, to work from. Um, my first photographic class was in way back in 1997, um, and it was a darkroom class. And for some reason, being in that very strange, weird, red lit room still is a place that is a source of inspiration for me. Um, before graduate school, I had been shooting with a Holga camera for many years, working on my Ipsiety series project. Most of my photographic projects have been about bending reality to get at something that's unseen. For me, the distortions that happened because of photography's relationship to time, space, and light helped me to shape my ideas into some sort of physical form that res resonated beyond just a representation. I was interested in evoking these unseen internal struggles and by breaking from a literal depiction of what the world looked like I could explore these more ephemeral ideas. I am someone who more or less will eventually respond well to being challenged. Um, during my first year in graduate school, during a critique, one of my professors turned to me and said, what does analog photography have to contribute to contemporary discourse on life and art? Don't you think it's a little nostalgic? Um, so this of course, annoyed me a bit and frustrated me quite a lot um, and made me question pretty much everything that I had been doing. So in response, I tried to reinvent what I thought I already knew. So I made objects out of resin with photographs embedded in them. I tried to collect ice cubes. I shot with a digital camera. I was using appropriated images. Um, I stopped making self-portraits in a sense. And generally I failed at a lot of experiments. I really wanted to find a place of stable footing to push back against this assumption. Um, but it was also the frustration was very real. So eventually I did find ground to stand on and I knew that I needed to be in the dark room. Something about the physical way that the paper actually holds the light and is transformed through this chemical process matters for me. And these are some of my early failures um, that we see on screen right now. I was trying to make images of nothing or that looked like nothing, but were actually of me. Um, I think I was trying to frustrate the viewer so that I wasn't the only one in the room who was annoyed. I was also really looking for some sort of visual language that um, could only be made in the dark room and yet at the same time, didn't feel like a photograph, that it somehow became something else. So lying in bed one night, I couldn't sleep, and I was watching the shadows move across the walls of my bedroom. What would happen if photo paper could record that moving shadow without a camera, without a negative? The direct trace of light and shadow onto the paper itself. 
a moment compressed into a single image and time collapsed down. And around this same time that I was flailing about in the dark, both literally and metaphorically, um, I also took an, a, an elective course in sound art. And one of the things that I was really struck by was that the history of sound art really parallels in some ways the history of photography. And I kept finding these points of overlap and slippage between these two means of recording. They both have a mechanical aspect to the making, relying on machines to etch a moment into something more permanent. There's also this odd tether to reality with both of them, um, but also a displacement. There's a moment that was and has passed, but now you can re-experience it. So I'm gonna play for you now two of my very first sound art sketches, I won't even call them pieces, um, that I made back in 2008. And so um, some of the things I was thinking about, frustration is one of them. Um, so the first piece, Pitching Piano. So this idea, I was sitting at my parents' piano that hadn't been tuned in years. Um, so this idea of attempting to find a moment of resonance that was never going to happen. Uh, so that again, that idea of frustration and something that was bound to fail. And then the other piece, dueling desires, um, I'm really interested in language and how language is an interesting medium to play with when you're playing with sound because the voice is so commonly used. I want that. I need that. I need you. I have that. I have you. I own that. I own you. You want you. I think I want that. You may you think, think I need that. that. You have me. I think I want that. You I think I have that. I should want that. I wish I wanted you. I should need that. So after these kind of early experiments, finally, my work and my thinking really kind of coalesced. Um, and this grew, all of these ideas kind of came together into my thesis project. The project is titled Concealed at First, At Last I Appear, which is actually a line taken from William Henry Fox Talbot. It's actually something he wrote in his early photographic processes and sent as a letter to someone else. I was really pushing the work into a larger scale, which allows the viewer to step into this parallel space. It's an alternate version of our own understanding of the world. They are all made without a camera. There's no lens, there's no aperture, there's no focusing of the wavelengths of light to make them deliberately converge to a specific point. Each is a direct recording of the shadow patterns that existed in a room at night. It's in some sense, the purest index, the one-to-one -one relationship between this image and what was actually there visibly in the space. And the further into the project I went, the more firmly I believed that I want to find ways for photography to exist, to be meaningful, without it having to depict what our eyes see. This break from a visually understood version of reality. So I was really embracing the abstraction of these patterns. I was also asking, how can I subvert the viewer's expectations, thereby twisting their notion of reality by actually being truthful? During this period, I had a really hard time explaining to others what my work was about and what it looked like. Um, so I started to refer to myself as the unknown stepchild of the artist Vera Luter and Abe Morell. Both of them use the camera obscura to record these unexpected images that somehow convey interior spaces that are informed and understood by what is outside and also how we understand a sense of place 
and how the camera has a really different relationship to these ideas than our own vision. So Vera Luter in particular really resonated for me. And I have a quote from her that I tend to borrow because it's so perfectly suited to how I think about my own work. She says, through the windows, the outside world flooded the space inside and penetrated my body. It was really an impressive experience on all levels. And I decided to turn it into an art piece. The space, the room inside which I had this experience would become the container to transform that very experience. The room would become a transfer station from outside to inside. The window itself, the eye that sees from inside out. One aspect of this project that I'm particularly drawn to is getting the opportunity to respond to different locations and creating site-specific work. In 2011, I had the chance to have two solo shows and at each I made the work in the same building that the gallery space existed in. So for this show in Connecticut at Real Artways, the building is actually an old typewriter factory, which I think is fantastic. And I was granted access to rooms on the upper floors to make these two large multi-paneled skiograms, the largest ones that I had ever made. This moment is also important for me because it was the first time that I presented sound with the photographic works. Um, I had started to play with the idea of translation after my first experiments in sound. And I latched onto this process of shifting my analog image to a digital copy and then translating the pixel values of that digital image into MIDI notes. So the shadow left on the paper is an abstraction of a moment. It's a translation of it in a sense. And then the oral projections are an additional translation of the original experience and also of the image itself via the constructed space of digital software. This collapsed visual moment is then reactivated by the sculptural projection of sound, forcing the presence of time and space back into the experience of the photographic object. So this is a detailed view of one of the panels in that six panel piece that was wrapping around the corner. And then here is an excerpt of the sound from that composition. And so at this point, I'm going to digress a little bit away from the skiogram work. One, because chronologically the work actually started to shift around this time. And the work that came out of this shift, I think actually really informs the newest work that I've been making, which is for the gallery in the McDonough Museum. So around 2012, this is when things started to shift. And at the time I talked a lot about the importance of the dark room in my work both process-wise and also conceptually, very much like I have today for you all. And I was at a portfolio review event and someone offered me the feedback that talking about the relevance of the darkroom wasn't really visible in the work itself, which is something I say to my graduate students all the time. Um, and so if the fact that these are made out of silver is really important, that should be visible. And of course this, a little bit annoyed me at first and also frustrated me, common uh, sentiments apparently for me. Um, but then it also stuck with me and I started to seek out ways that I could manipulate the silver itself in the paper so that you could see some residue of these chemical alterations that I was talking about. Um, and I actually learned about a non-historical alternative process that is called chromoscedasic sabatier, which is a mouthful. 
And I started applying these chemicals on top of smaller skiograms that I was making of my home. So that's what you see here. I was trying to pin down for myself what makes darkroom photography unique. And one component of that is that the grains of silver react to light, physically changing to create a permanent image. What I love about chromo is that it's actually altering the shape and size of the grains of silver that are embedded in the paper to create the color that you're seeing in these pieces. The light and chemistry are actually altering the object itself. Around this time, I was also introduced to the pioneering work of Pierre Cordier, who invented the chemogram. The idea of resists and as a method of mark making really resonated for me, as well as his rich color palette and the range of textures he was able to produce. After a while, I realized that I was actually more interested in finding new colors or experimenting with mark making than I was with the skiogram patterns. And so I stopped making that component and began to create chemical paintings, which coalesced into this body of work. I really started experimenting. I embraced that this was closer to painting than to photography. And early on, I was flexing muscles that had really atrophied as I hadn't done any serious drawing in, since I had been in college. I attempted to allude to figurative, ge figurative gestures and forms. And I was also thinking about how these could reference landscapes. I deeply enjoyed making these, but also my de desire to just experiment and test meant that I often strayed from any sort of representational illusions. I was really interested in creating depth and layers and textures and trying to expand the visual vocabulary that I was beginning to develop with these works. So for some of them, I used spray bottles and stippling techniques with the chemistry in certain areas like you see here. Some others were dipped and dunked into different chemicals and in different orders to create layered patterns. And finally, I started adding resists like gaffer's tape or painter's tape to create hard lines and unexpected patterns in the work. So at the end of 2016, in addition to the large political shifts that happened in the country, I had other shifts happening in my personal life. I suddenly wanted to take this process of chemical painting and say something more specific with it. I experimented with different resists until I found one that created a web-like pattern across the surface of the paper. Somehow this resonated in a new way for me and a new series began to take shape. The title, Infracertum, is Latin, and according to Google Translate, means fixed below. I wanted the reference to the darkroom process, but also this idea that there are things at work below the surface. This body of work is both a challenge to the medium of photography and an attempt to find a visual language that can address our complex time. The more I worked with this pattern, the more it felt like an effective way to talk about some of the large abstract ideas and issues that I was concerned with. For example, how do you take a photograph of the internet? How do you photograph implicit bias and societal misogyny? I'm interested in thinking about how to address what isn't seen. There are all of these intangible forces that shape our reality from the intimate to the cosmic. The patterns evoke so many things that I'm interested in, maps, rock formations, biological growth, but also neurons, veins, and blood vessels. To me, these are fundamentally photographic. The only way to make these is for silver salts to react with chemicals, time, and light. So while I acknowledge that this often does not fit the normal expectations of what a photograph should be, I do think it is photography. By stripping away the indexical, now there is potential to address ideas that cannot be neatly captured by a camera. As this project grew, I kept thinking about what happens when things break down. I wondered what would happen if I removed chunks of paper. When things fall apart after they are put back together, they're never quite the same. Little pieces can go missing. The first time I did this in my dark room, I was oddly terrified. You do not cut photo paper. Um, it made me really uncomfortable. And I've actually heard from others that often these pieces make them feel uncomfortable. And strangely, I kind of respect and enjoy that response. So of course I pushed it further. This led to more cuts, disjointed pieces being matched together. I love that this work sits in this weird place at the intersection of other mediums. They don't fit a specific apperceptive type to circle back to the beginning. The title of each piece is Untitled Chemical Painting, 
but it is also a unique photograph that is a collage. I enjoy holding these contradictions. I feel a tension in making a photograph without any referential pull to reality in breaking from the norms of the photographic picture plane. So now circling back to my skiogram work and the project concealed at first at last I appear. After my work kind of branched off into the realm of chemical painting, I ended up taking a break from this project specifically um, due to time, financial restrictions, and also they're huge and it's really difficult to store them. Um, I continued to think about what they mean and why they matter to me, but they were kind of in the back seat for a little while. But in 2017, I was thrilled to get a residency at Mass Mocha and the staff of Assets for Artists were really amazing in helping me gain access to places all over the museum's campus to make new exposures. This intense period of making reignited the fire to return to this body of work. It felt unfinished in some ways, or maybe that it never quite been complete. And also in addition, while I was there, I was working on new sound compositions. I was specifically translating tweets into different sounds as a way to process my thoughts on what was happening politically in the country. So both veins of my original making got reactivated during this residency. So now I'm actually gonna shift and I wanna talk a little bit about the work that's included in the show and give you a little bit of the background into the thinking and the making and how things ended up the way that they did in that space. Um, so this is one of the few pieces that is not new specifically for the McDonough exhibition. Um, I made this triptych in the spring of 2018 for an exhibition that I had in Utah in that fall. Um, and it's a translation of my home and it was specifically to kind of take a part of my house and put it there into Utah. One of the things that was really interesting for me is that I had recently heard a lecture by the sound artist Jacob Kierkegaard and he talked a lot about layering sound back onto itself as a way to find resonant frequencies and new understandings of a specific place. And I was really interested in how that concept could be applied visually as opposed to sonically. So each panel of this triptych is actually a really new technique for me. It's holding a record of different spaces blended together, all from the first floor of my house, but they're kind of collapsing in on each other. So different moments, because I have to make part of the exposure, roll it up, move to another place, make another part of the exposure, um, all gets combined and layered into a single exposure image plane. And the sound piece that accompanies this one that is uh, one of the ones that's projected into the gallery space is um, both a pixel to MIDI translation, the way that I was describing it earlier. And also there are field recordings that I made around the first floor of the house that are layered in on top of the sonic translation of the images. Now, shifting to some of the new work that I made in the last six months for the show, um, it's kind of impossible to talk about this work without talking about the circumstances that we've been living through. Um, when COVID altered our way of living last year, everything kind of just stopped. And then we all waited. And originally Claudia and I had talked about me coming to your campus um, to make new site specific works for the exhibition. However, as the fall semester began, it really still wasn't safe for me to travel that far. And so we were brainstorming how to modify the exhibition. And I suggested instead of making work on campus that I translate the only space that I have access to, which is my home, and then to install that into the gallery. So in a sense, there is still a little bit of a site specificity. It's just not a site that you all are ever gonna get to see. Um, so, Claudia graciously agreed to this idea and I began to map out where I was gonna make the new pieces for the show. The result is the installation that's titled Dwelling that consists of seven unique skiograms and the seven part sound composition that is the translation of those images. The hang of the work is actually very new for me and very deliberate um, as the placement of each skiogram in the gallery space is roughly analogous to where it was made in my home. 
in a sense, I've recreated the footprint of a segment of my house in the space of the gallery. With the sound, I chose to map certain octaves to specific electronic instruments, and that stayed consistent for each of the seven movements, hopefully creating a cohesion to the work and setting an emotional undertone to the space. In thinking about this, the term dwelling fits so many facets of how I was feeling as I was making the work. The home as a shelter, as a place of safety, the physical structure of the building itself, but also the mental aspect of dwelling on an idea or a reality. How can you not dwell on things in a moment like this? And as I was making the mural ski, ski grams, I noticed that the light coming into my house at night was actually quite different than the last time I had made work there. Places that I had thought would work for new murals no longer really functioned. So one of my solutions was to fragment and break apart what would have been a single mural exposure. This started as kind of a logistical fix, but as I kept thinking about how I hovered and shifted through the same few spots over and over again in my house, this broken apart interpretation made more and more sense. In some ways, I can imagine an overlay of different days, different versions of myself inhabiting the exact same locations in this one room, never leaving, having a bit of a fragmented life in part. So this fractured piece together constellation of shadows somehow reflected a lot of what I was feeling about this particular space, my living room, which is where I've spent the majority of my time for this past year. Another thing that I kept circling back to as I thought about this work, but also the circumstances under which I was making it was how my perception of time has been so altered by being confined to the house. Days can feel like weeks, months, sometimes feel like they last a lifetime. And yet I'm having a really hard time believing that it's been, we're at the one year mark of this pandemic because sometimes I swear it started yesterday. Um, there was this one little spot in my dining room where there wasn't enough shadows and light to make a large skiogram, but it was perfect for these small 16 by 20s. I'm a bit of a rule lover. And for those of you who know me, you can empathize. Um, and so I created some rules for this project, this specific piece. Um, I decided to try and make the exact same image over and over again in the exact same location, knowing that that's really impossible to do. Um, but as I made them on the back of each piece of paper, I wrote how I had experienced time for that day. This then dictated how I made the sound translations. Each image that got shifted into notes was the exact same size so that I had the same number of notes, 500 exactly, for each sound composition. I again used the same instruments for each, this time trying to evoke something a little bit more familiar. So I used piano, strings, and my own voice that was triggered by the MIDI controller to create the sonic vignettes. Then I altered the tempo and sometimes layered different speeds together to play with how these 500 notes are experienced based on my own experiences from that day. I kept thinking about the repetition of movement, of gestures, of how doing the same thing over and over again never quite allows you to replicate the results. In some ways, I felt that the large installation of dwelling is about the physical inhabiting of my home, whereas this piece, never ever the same, is much more about the psychological aspects of dwelling on my home in this time. So I'm gonna play for you. This piece is actually not projected into the gallery. There are QR codes. There's a QR code on the wall label. So if you bring headphones with you and your cell phone or some other device into the gallery space, you can listen while you're looking at the work. Um, and this is an ex excerpt of the first piece in the upper left-hand corner.
So I want to end by talking a little bit about translation again. And the reason this became such a core idea for this project has to do with how I'm actually interacting and sharing work with you today and the nature of what I make. From the first moment that I attempted to re-photograph one of my skiograms, I realized that a digitized version was never going to come close to recreating the experience in person. And so for those of you who are in Ohio and can make it to the show in person, I hope you can move through the space for yourself and see, hear, and feel the work. I certainly wish that I was there to experience it with you. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Amy. Um, so if anyone has a question, I can unmute you if you want to raise your hand, or if you would like to put it in the chat, I can certainly um, ask the question for you. Um, I have a couple of questions, and maybe this will get some other um, ideas generated. Um, so this past year where you've been working strictly out of your home, how do you think, if you can um, talk about this now, if you're able to figure this out, how do you think this will affect uh, your production of work overall. Um, I, I, I feel like many artists um, are still too close to the situation and that there will be a lot of work produced, um, you know, in hindsight about, you know, when, when people can look at things or feel things more objectively about the past year. But I wondered, you know, since you've been limited to your home, if you have thought about how you might approach your art making uh, site specifically in the future? That's a really good question. Um, I, it's really interesting. Um, in some ways, one of the things that's happened um, is because I had this show with you and I actually had another show in the fall. Um, having deadlines forced me to make work when I maybe wouldn't have. Um, it would have been very easy to say, you know, it's too complex of a moment. I, you know, I don't really have access to things, but because I had, you know, obligations, it forced me to kind of troubleshoot in a way, but also to kind of make peace with a different way of making. Um, I also think there's something about the accessibility of like, I can come into my house. I, I don't leave my house. <laughs> um, and so there's something about having that repeated access that's actually really changed, right? Like the, the never ever the same piece I could never have made in a traditional site specific opportunity because I've made it over multiple months. Um, I'm actually still working on that piece and expanding it and continuing to add to it. And normally I have maybe two or three days to work with a specific site to make my exposures. So there's something about that cycling over a very extended period of time that I'm finding really interesting. So I don't know if that means doing more long-term collaborations with institutions or places, um, but I don't know 100% yet how all of this is gonna kind of shake out. Um, but I have, I have definitely noticed a, a very different shift in my work, just the fact that I wanted to hang works off the wall instead of having everything on the wall. I'm, I think I'm so much more aware of space because it's been so confined for the last year. Um, so I'm curious to see how that will continue to play out. I wondered if you might seek out spaces that are, um, you know, emotionally charged, politically charged, um, you know. Yeah. Some, you know, some of your work in the past had been in response to, you know, the political social situation and, um, you know. Yeah, and it's definitely something that um, there, during that period where I wasn't making the skiograms, I actually was constantly like, oh, where could I go 
that would be an opportunity to have the place itself contribute to the work. Um, so I'm a huge fan of William Henry Fox Talbot. He's he, like his writing really helped shape some of my thinking. And apparently there are residencies at Lecoq Abbey, which is his home. Um, so to go there and to be able to make work would be astonishing. Um, but also thinking about spaces that hold meaning publicly, um, right. even something as simple as churches or you know, um, public buildings and getting access to those. Um, I think it'll be, as much as I dream about those, I think post pandemic, those will be some of the hardest ones to negotiate. Um, but hopefully some of that will start to manifest. Thank you. Um, so um, I was, uh, I have a question from the chat um, from Tina. Why do you think these art pieces, <clears throat> excuse me, evoke the emotions that they do? Because for me, I'm used to looking at art pieces and I feel something because I know what I am looking at. Are the feelings the same for everyone? I have no idea. That's a really good question, Tina. Um, I And I have such a different view because I know so much about how they were made. And so I bring my own emotional register to the work when I'm making it. Um, but I don't know how, I, I don't always get to hear how other people perceive it. Um, so I don't know if that um, emotional response is a universal one or a much more individualized one. I'd be curious to hear. Yes, if anyone has seen the exhibition and they want to um, chime in and share their feelings about what they saw or their experiences. Um, so Dylan has a question. Could you tell us a little bit about your workflow? I only have experience in digital photography and I find the process of using the darkroom very interesting, especially since you manipulate them in such unique ways. Um, my process is, uh... It sounds really simple now when I describe it, but when I was kind of figuring out how to make them, it was so complicated. Um, essentially, I have, and actually, do you see all the rolls of paper back here? So that's kind of the scale of the darkroom paper that I have. Um, they're huge, they're four feet wide rolls and they're 33 feet long. And so I, cut a section of paper to length in my dark room, roll it up, take it to the place where I'm gonna make the exposure. And then I have to unroll it relatively quickly, get it in position, and then I make the exposure. Almost all of them are 60 seconds. Um, the timing has to do more with the paper's sensitivity to light than it does um, the space itself. So if you're familiar with digital photography, it's a lot like the ISO. So my paper is like the ISO of the camera. Um, and from then, I just go into the dark room and I don't have to do anything else. I have uh, custom built troughs to develop the paper in. And I do kind of a scroll development and I go through the standard dark room chemistry of developer stop fixer. I wash them and they're done. Um, so it, it sounds really simple when I say it that way. And if you've ever done dark room photography, I don't have to do test strip. Well, I do two test strips sometimes, but I'm not, uh, there's no burning and dodging. There's no complex attempt to um, recreate the image because I know that there's only going to be one of them. Um, so that's a little bit more about the darkroom side of things and how that process works. But you probably had to do exposure tests in order to determine that 60 seconds was the appropriate length of time. Um, when I started this process in graduate school, I went through, I think, 10 to 20 different types of paper mm -hmm. to figure out what paper would be the one that gave me the best contrast results in the image. Um, so, and also was available in rolls and that was not $1,000 a box. And <laughs> um, so there was uh, one whole, my program was actually we had intensive summers and so we would go full time eight weeks in the summer and I took an entire summer to try and figure out the technical side of the process. 
Okay, I have a couple more questions, which is great. Hannah says, what made you choose your method of attachment with the magnets with no frames instead of just normal framing and hanging? Originally, I'm, I'm somebody who will always be completely transparent. I'm not gonna try and um, blow smoke about any of this. Originally, it was because I couldn't afford to frame them. Um, when I got an initial quote, they wanted to mount the photographic paper to a stable base. And they're like, yeah, we normally ask for three copies of the print before we mount it because it's, you know, it's not always a one and done kind of process. You can get wrinkles and you can get bubbles. It's like, these are unique. I don't have multiple copies. <laughs> so that terrified me a little bit, but also the quote that they gave me was $1,400 for my smallest mural. Um, and so that was not something I could budget. And I really wanted the work to be seen. I didn't want it to just live in my studio. And so for my thesis show, because the cost was so prohibitive, I really thought about what would make sense in terms of a hanging system. And going back to Fox Talbot again, in his writing about coming up with a positive and negative process in the darkroom, he actually talks about the parallel with magnets. Um, because of the polar ends and how they're attracted to one another and how they're intrinsically related to each other. So I thought that was a really neat way to add another layer of homage to Fox Talbot, even though most people wouldn't know that. Um, so I really liked that magnet system. It was minimal and it also made the images feel more like objects, which is in a way kind of how I still think about them. Um, and in a lot of senses, I still use the same system. One, because it means that I can ship, I don't, 11, I think I sent you 11 murals. Um, if, you know, if those were all framed, the shipping costs alone for that would be astronomical because they're so big. Um, so it allows me to work with institutions and with museums and with gallery spaces that maybe don't have an enormous shipping budget. Um, and for the work to still be seen in a wide way, which is something that matters to me. Thanks. Um, Sam has a question. I love working in the dark room. I find it very peaceful, but my question is, do you have an idea of how things will turn out before you get your final result or is it always a surprise? It's a combination. Um, I think, at one point I was getting pretty good at guessing, but now there are always places and spaces in the images that are unexpected. And I think this is one of the things that I'm really fascinated in, this idea that like there's a, a parallel version of our own world that exists that we can't see. Um, and there's something about the way the photo paper records an image that's different than the way our eyes perceive it. And I really love that shift and having that disconnect come up in the work. And so I, I really enjoy, so there's certain things that I can now identify. Um, so I live in New England. We have a ton of really, really old homes. Um, the way that glass gets that kind of ripple when it's really old, I know that that actually shows up in the images, which is really cool. Um, but there are other things like sometimes I don't see details in a shadow that is outside the window, but it ends up in the um, skiogram. So it's kind of a mix of having an educated guess and then having things surprise me once I'm finished. Uh, Dylan has another question. He says, so you stand by the sort of philosophy of one print and that's it similar to photographer William Eggleston, who only takes one photo of each subject? It is a little similar. Um, I actually, well, actually, no, I, I'll try and make work in the same place, but because of the nature of the way that the work happens, it's almost impossible to get an exact duplicate. There are too many variables that are uncontrollable. Um, so like in the exhibition, the diptych that's hanging off the wall that's suspended in the gallery space, um, that's the exact same spot as the single panel that was made in February of 2020 that's hanging somewhere nearby, I think, in the gallery. Um, that literally hung in the exact same spot 
just one's two panels and one is one panel, and they still don't look the same. Um, and the never ever idea, also I'm trying to do it in the same place, but it's not the same. But the idea of the uniqueness of the piece was actually something that I really wanted when I was originally conceiving of the work, um, right? That sense that, again, going against what our expectations are for photography, the idea that photography is reproducible, that you can take a single negative and you could make a thousand prints from that one negative and they would all be related to each other in a way. With mine, there is no negative, so there's no way for me to reproduce it in that mechanical sense, the way that we've kind of come to understand photography. So that, that aspect of the unique definitely was um, a deliberate choice on my part. Okay, uh, and Tina has uh, another question. How long can you expose the photo? Oh, probably, depend. well, I think if I had a low enough light, you could probably do a couple of minutes. Um, the longer it goes, the more the entire piece of paper just becomes black. Um, so there I have had had wonderful experiences <laughs> where I go to make an exposure and I think I've got everything perfect and then I develop it and it's just a black piece of paper. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> there is still a little bit of the trial and error and the experimentation, um, particularly when I get to new spaces. Well, um, so one last question that I have is, do you, um, have you had debates with other photographers about this, not necessarily the skiogram process, but more the chemogram or the, the chemical painting that that is photography or is it painting <laughs> or is it drawing? <laughs> um, I have, and I've also, um, heard through the grapevine, if you will. Um, there was, a, so most states will have um, grants for artists and they tend to be categorized. And so there's the photography grant. And there was one year that I submitted my work and I heard through the grapevine that one of the jurors said that my work was not photography and so I shouldn't get the grant. Um, so there, there is definitely, and it's also, I'm, I'm, deeply engaged with the Society of Photographic Education. I love that organization, but it is something still where when I share work at like the portfolio walkthrough or if I'm uh, talking to somebody who's maybe um, in a different stage of their photographic education, they're kind of like, what is that? I don't, I, is that photography? I don't know if that's, I'm not sure if that really fits what it is. Um, and I have painter friends who actually will tell me that they do think that it is more painting than photography. Um, and I like, I like that ambiguity. Um, for me, if, it, if it's only my opinion that matters, <laughs> then I do think that it is more photography than anything else. Because right when you think about painting, it's about pigments, and it's about mixing colors. And that is so much about what makes painting unique is that selection of colors and the way that colors function against each other and the palettes that people choose and I don't get to do that. That's a whole aspect that's removed from me. Um, and it's also there's something about the way that the image sits in the paper instead of on the surface because of how the silver is embedded in the paper that I also think ends up creating a different distinction. Um, it looks different but I do like that there's that uh, conundrum. I don't like it when I lose grants, but I do like it. <laughs> All right, um, does anybody else have a question they would like to ask um, of Amy before we sign off here for the day? I don't see any more in the chat. Um, well, I would like to say, oh wait, there's a question. Um, oh, how do I, how do I, oh, I has to unmute. So can you, un oh, there you go. Hello, thank you very much for letting me uh, uh, say something. I wanted to say that this is the most superb presentation I've listened to in a very long time. And that clearly there is a, a very, um, 
a very unique intellect behind all of this. Uh, and I wanted to thank her very much indeed for sharing her work and her thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you. I would agree. Um, she is has a very thoughtful intellectual approach to her art making and um, you know, her work is very, seems very driven by the process, but that isn't necessarily the case, I would say, after you hear her talk about it. Mm -hmm. I think even the way the, um, the presentation is put together showed an awful lot of work and uh, commitment to uh, a, a unified whole. So I just wanted to say thank, thank you very much again. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So we did get one more question in the chat and we'll make this our last one. How do you overcome these skepticisms about your work and what drives you to keep going? Because as an artist, I feel like it can be very difficult. Yes. <laughs> one, let me um, affirm that it, it can be really difficult. Um, I think in some ways for me, um, I don't think I could make anything else. Um, this is this is kind of how my brain works. And so I'm locked into this way of thinking and trying to understand things through this. Um, I think it's also that I've very much made with what, um, where I sit within a larger context, um, right? So I, I have found a wonderful sense of um, acceptance in nonprofit spaces and academic galleries and academic museums um, because I think there's a lot of curiosity in those places and there's an openness to understanding things that are not the same. Um, and I also have found that I have not had a lot of success with commercial institutions so far, um, which I'm also okay with. Um, I think one of, one of the things that I, so I teach graduate students and one of the things I encourage them to think about on a regular basis is trying to figure out how do you define success for yourself, not what somebody else defines as success for you. Um, because it's allowed me to stay within myself a little bit more and to stay to the work rather than changing what I made. So for example, I had uh, feedback at one point that with my chemical paintings, they really didn't like all of the browns and the yellow and the oranges. And they're like, well, if you could make all of them kind of blue and green and purple and pink, I could sell those for you. And I, I didn't want to alter what the work was for me to conform to that. Um, so I think there's also something there to kind of reckon with for yourself before you maybe put the work out there publicly or maybe test the waters and see. Um, but it is, it can be very hard. Um, and also I think finding community, finding other people who believe in what you do, um, friends, peers, um, other folks, no matter where they are, who are like-minded in what they're thinking about when they make their work. Um, definitely helps keep you going, so. Also, um, over time, uh, trial and error, um, you discover that there are certain places that are better fits for your work, as you said. Um, and so then you, you learn from that and you figure out, you know, this is where I need to focus my energies, right? I think that you know your work uh, is very innovative too, um, you know all aspects of it, and so I think that um, you know institutions of higher learning, you know, are really drawn to that kind of thing um, as well, you know. So I agree. I also the one other oh gosh, I just had it on the tip of my tongue. Um, nope, it's gone. If I think of it in the next few seconds, I'll tell you. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, thank you, Amy. I think uh, this has been a wonderful talk, uh, very informative. And as you were talking, I kept thinking, oh, I'm going to ask her about this related to what she just said. And then you covered it. And so I thought it was very thorough. And um, and I hope that if uh, some of the people watching haven't been able to come in and see the exhibition, that they will. The galleries are open 11 to 4, Tuesday through Saturday, and um, the show will run through April 2nd, which is a Friday. So, all right. Thank you all very much for coming and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>